high and proclaim what we profess. I believe that this is the perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I desire not only to read it, to know it, but through the power of God's Holy Spirit to live it. Amen? In the power of God's Holy Spirit, and that is the only way we can function. Praise the Lord. Turn with me if you would. 1 Corinthians. We'll be picking up in chapter 2 this morning. But previously in chapter 1, imagine that. Previously, Paul introduced himself and he greeted the church. He reminded the church congregation that he was the planter of the church, but he was also quick, Paul was also quick to remind the Corinthian church, hey, this is God's church. And we're quick to remind one another here at Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley, this is God's church. And we're grateful for that reality. And so Paul, again, once again, he greeted, he reintroduced himself, said, hey, it's been a while. But then Paul quickly brought to, his, brought to the attention of the church, hey, I heard there's some divisions in the church. Well, some of you are saying that I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of et cetera, et cetera. And Paul's saying, hey, wait a minute, is Jesus Christ divided? And obviously the answer is, of course not. Too often we get our eyes on the pulpit and we forget about the Lord. Isaiah confessed that when the Lord took the king, Isaiah realized, wait a minute, I have been having my eyes on the king and my eyes need to be on the king of kings. And so that's what Paul was saying, hey, get your eyes focused back on Jesus Christ. All too often, here in the Western world, we're looking at flash bang and we're looking at, our, uh, at, at, at pretty dress or whatever, clean appearance, articulation and things like that. And the Lord say, hey, I'll use whatever and whoever I want, but as long as Jesus Christ is being preached, that's the Spirit-filled church. We're not looking for flash or bang. We shouldn't be. We cannot be drawn away by these things. And that's what Paul is saying. Hey, it's God's church. And God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And Paul is offering himself as, look at me. And we kind of look at Paul historically. He seemed to be a kind of a shorter guy in stature, crunched over. Some suggest he even had a, a big old wicked witch of the west nose, perhaps. I mean, he wasn't much to look at. But that was the whole point that Paul was saying, hey, it's not about me or my appearance or my ability to speak, it's Jesus and Him alone. And so Paul was reminding the Corinthian church, hey, be very careful. And of course, this letter to the church is front page news for us, isn't it? We need to be very careful. Quite often we follow after people that look good or are handsome or whatnot. Or speak in a fluid way. I mean, we need to speak coherently, obviously. But God can even use different kinds of speaking and such. But we need, as long as we're focused on Christ, we're okay. So Paul concluded last time his salutation by reestablishing a simple truth for all born-again believers. To all born-again believers... He who glories, Paul reminded us last time, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to brag, brag on what the Lord is doing in your life. And give him all the credit. I like to say jokingly on occasion, someone says, hey, great message. I say, hey, I blame the Lord. That's just my little joker way of, of saying that. But hey, it's all about the, yo, thanks, praise, I'm glad you got touched. But you know what? Talk to him about it. Great, I'm, you know, we'll fellowship together and such, but I blame the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. Remember, Paul was saying, what I taught you. I taught you Christ crucified. And I spent 18 months with you. And when I left, the church was absolutely intact. The church lacked nothing when I left. But now I'm starting to hear some of these rumblings 
And now I've got to deal with them. Paul would have much rather been dealing with other things. He'd much rather be evangelizing. He'd much rather be planting other churches, which of course he did. But he couldn't neglect the rumblings that were coming from Corinth. The church. Paul's thinking, the church that I planted, and all of a sudden everybody's going three different directions. What's going on? Christ is not divided. This has to stop. It will stop. I will bring correction as we will see as we continue through this letter to the Corinthians, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Paul was, was bringing it. It stops. In fact, some people I'm, I might even have to remove from the church, he warns, and, and, and did. It stops. The Lord, uh, Paul says through the Lord's guidance, this division stops. That's what goes on outside the doors of the church, but it will not be tolerated under this roof, Paul is saying. It won't. You think it will, but it won't. I will bring correction with the authority of the Lord. So Father, we ask you to bless your word this morning. We thank you for it. What a great letter to the Corinthians, but yet how relevant it is for today. Teach us. We're here to hear from you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And I, brethren... When I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Hey, I just came just like Jesus came. Paul is saying, I didn't come with great pomp or circumstance. I came just like Jesus came. Well, how did Jesus come? Well, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be reminded that Jesus, born to the Virgin Mary, was delivered in a manger. Now, can you imagine, we got up this morning and it was 60 degrees, you know, 59 degrees this morning. We're thinking, oh, it's freezing out. And we were in the comfort of our own homes, wrapped up in little blankets and things. And yet Jesus was born outside in a dirt patch, technically. And it was cold out there. That's how Jesus came. Jesus came and was introduced with humble beginnings born in a manger. Now we remember that Jesus lived a quiet life for 30 years with his common everyday parents. Mary and Joseph, they were not people of renown. Joseph, common guy, regular guy, much like us. Mary, regular gal. And so Jesus lived a quiet life, a humble life for some 30 years with his parents. When Jesus did finally reveal himself as Messiah at the appointed time, he was then despised and rejected. We would kind of think that as Jesus revealed himself as Messiah, he would be welcomed, right? But he was despised. Finally, we remember that Jesus humbled himself even unto the cross. Paul is saying, that's the way I came and planted this church, in humility. I didn't ask for anything. I just came, and I brought the gospel. And the Lord brought you in, and I taught you. I asked for nothing. I just asked for your attention at the most. I asked you to consider a few things that I had on my heart that I wanted to impart on you, impart to you. That's all. So I didn't come with excellence of speech or I didn't come with mankind's wisdom. Because in verse 2, I was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's it. That's the way Paul came. Now we remember Paul the Apostle was at one time a man of status. When Paul the Apostle was Saul of Tarsus, he was a man of status, wasn't he? Well, he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was recognized and well known. His reputation went before him. He was at one time a man of renown recognized throughout the area. But now Paul... He put away all that once he met Jesus. He put that away and submitted himself solely 
on to the authority of Christ. And that's how Paul is reminding this congregation at Corinth, hey, I came and gave you everything I had. I didn't talk you into anything. I didn't try to schmooze you into anything. I brought you the gospel and God breathed on it and touched your hearts and you became born again. To God be the glory, Paul is reminding the Corinthian church. Paul continues on in verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Paul will expand on that a little later. But he continues on, my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive words of human wisdom, but my words were in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I heard Damian Kyle one time mention, great teacher, if you pull him up on the radio or on, on the internet, Damian Kyle, marvelous guy, dry sense of humor, knows the Bible inside and out, just a great guy, Damien Kyle, I heard him speaking one time at a pastor's conference and, and Damien was saying, you know, sometimes I listen to certain preachers and their teaching, their message is so polished and so smooth and almost even oily that when I try to grab hold of it, it just slips right out of my hands. I thought, what a brilliant, poetic way of demonstrating the eloquence of verbiage. Sometimes it can be so slick that there's nothing to grab onto. It just kind of boop, like that bar of soap slips right out of your hand. Nothing to hold on. No rough edges, no, no, no handles or anything to grab onto and say, yeah, that's mine. And I like the way he said that. And that's what, what Paul is saying here. I, I came in weakness, fear, and trembling. I was nothing to be observed and, and admired. But I came with reality. I came and you know that you took a hold of my teaching and my preaching and you were able to hold on to it. Because it wasn't polished or smoothed down or, or even oiled or lacquered over. It was relatable and usable. It was the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Way too many teachings are being presented today that just slip out of people's hands. They're too slick. They're too perfect. They need to just be put up on a little shelf and looked at. Ooh, isn't that great? Well, how do I apply that in my life? I don't, but it sure looks great. Right? That's what's going on. And a lot of presentations are so smooth and so slick, they just slip right past it. They are not in the power of God. Remember when the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Hey, Moses, you're going to go talk to Pharaoh. You're going to tell Pharaoh, Hey, Pharaoh, I'm representing Jehovah God, and he says, Let my people go. And Moses right away objects. Moses says, Gee, I can't even hardly talk. But Moses was a very trained man. But I have to believe that was the Lord revealing himself to Moses and in a humble condition as Moses knew that he was in the presence of the holy of holy the holiest of all Moses kind of dropped it down a few notches wow lord how am i going to represent you every time i open up god's word to prepare for the following week to teach i say lord you need to teach me before i even consider breaking any of this down to anybody else they're your kids lord Teach me. I won't let you go, Lord, until you teach me. And I'm being a little sarcastic in that, but believe me, that's what happens in my office every Monday morning. Lord, you've got to teach me. You have to. I'm not leaving this office until you start opening us up to me first. And so Moses humbled himself under the mighty hand of God, and, and the Lord responds and said, okay, Moses, that staff you have in your hand, throw it down on the ground. Moses threw it down, it turned to a serpent. Now, I don't know about you, I've got a walking stick that I use, and on occasion, I'll throw it down on the sidewalk, just to check. <laughs> but guess what? 
it remains a staff. And if I were to walk away, it would remain there until the next person comes by and picks it up. Moses, let me show you my power. Great, Lord. I'm ready for it. Boom. Fair enough. God's power. That's what we want to come into this pulpit with, not flash and bang and anything like that. We want to come in with God's power. That's why this church has been here for over 30 years, going on 35 years. And there were times when I first got to this church some 20 plus years ago, I told the Lord, I looked around and I said, Lord, there's 25 people here after a major split. Major. And my wife and I came here and I had my two-year-old son with me and I looked around and I realized and I said, Lord, you could close this church down no trouble. I mean, it would be... No one would question it. Because it went from 150 to 200 people down to 25 people. And Lord, you could easily shutter this church and no one would say, oh gee, that was wrong. No, you could shutter this church easily. But I said, but Lord, you haven't and therefore I know this is your church. It's your church. And it was at that point that I said, I'm dedicating myself and my family to this church. That was some 23, 22, 23 years ago, whatever it was. And I'm committing to you, Lord. I'm committing to Pastor Jim. And I'm committing to this church. That's it. It was done. It was never an issue. It wasn't like, well, they got a better worship team down the road, so I'm going to go down there. Never. We committed ourselves here, and this is where we are, because this is God's church. And I saw that with those 25 people. I saw that. I saw that. I said, fair enough. This is where we're going to invest, right here. And so Moses saw God's power. said, Moses, I'm going to use you to demonstrate my power to, to Pharaoh. And Paul was saying, I came with God's message, with his power to speak to you. To plant a church. A church is just a place that we can come. We know where we're going to meet. Hey, we're going to meet at the church. Great. See you there at 7. See you there at 8. Whatever. Got it. That's the church building. And that's what Paul was, was doing. He said, hey, we're going to meet here. And I've got some words from the Lord. Fantastic. And in verse 6, Paul continues, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, Paul was saying. I speak wisdom to those who are mature, yet I don't, my crew and myself, we do not speak in the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. What's one guarantee that we all have that we share together in this room? We're all going to die someday. That's a guarantee. We share that reality. Paul is saying, I don't come in the power of mankind. I come in the power of Jesus. Because mankind, your, your rulers and your leaders, they're going to breathe their last eventually. So Paul is saying, so why would I want you to invest in something that's going to pass away? I don't want you to invest in something that's going to pass away. I want you to invest in God. So I didn't come with human wisdom because eventually that's going to fade away. Verse 7, but we speak, Paul saying, myself and my entourage speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Interesting word, a mystery. The hidden wisdom, Paul goes on, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they had known, they would have, cru they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. We speak the wisdom of God. But yet to some, it's a mystery. Many people spend their whole life sitting and hearing God's word, but they haven't been allowed to crack the mystery because they don't care. They're coming in, punching their time card, thinking they're impressing the Lord, saying, look, Lord, I was at New Year's Eve service. Look, Lord, I was at Christmas service. Look, Lord, I was at the Easter, Easter service. I was even at the sunrise service, Lord. And they're thinking they're impressing the Lord. And Paul is saying, hey, there's a, a mystery, a hidden 
wisdom, and it's all about God. Paul go, Now hold that thought for a second, because Paul goes on to paraphrase Isaiah 64, 4. Paul says, it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Paul's paraphrasing Isaiah 64. And Paul is saying, hey, there's a mystery that even Isaiah spoke about. Remember in Matthew chapter 13, we consider Matthew chapter 13 the chapter of the parables. Jesus spoke several parables parables to the crowds that followed hard after him. The parables of Matthew chapter 13. A parable in simple definition. A parable is simply a relatable story that has a heavenly meaning. That's just the simplicity of what a parable is. We use that word a lot. A parable, a parable. But it's a relatable story story with a heavenly meaning. Now Jesus, as we see, was desiring to be relatable to his audience. We never find Jesus doing this to normal everyday people, do we? Now he did to the religious leaders, but that's an entirely different subject. To folks like you and I, oh yes, like the woman at the well... Jesus spoke relatably. Do you and I speak relatably to those that don't have the Lord? Or are we pushing them away or running them off by saying, Oh, God's mad at you. Oh, he's going to get you for that. Oh, got drunk over the weekend. Oh, tis, tis. Is that what we do? You know, when that was being displayed to me while I was in the world, I just began shutting that person off. There was no evangelical value in that kind of confrontation. I knew I was in the wrong. I didn't need anybody to remind me of that. The Lord was doing a great enough job on His own. Imagine that. What I needed was someone to say, you know what? This is not God's plan for your life. Now, he'll allow you, as you can see, to to operate in this fashion. You go for it, but are you enjoying yourself? I needed that kind of a conversation. That's the kind of conversation, that relatable conversation that your acquaintances need. They need that from you. They're not going to get it from their drinking buddy. They're not going to get it from the guy that's selling them baggies of white stuff. They're going to get it from you. They're going to get it from me. Hey, man, God's got a better plan for you. That's what they need to hear. And that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus would sit down with people and give relatable stories. And people go, oh, wow, this is great. Now, people responded differently, but Jesus met folks in a relatable situation. Fair enough? And so there's two fascinating, there's many fascinating things, but there's two fascinating things in Matthew 13 that jump out at me. Number one, first, as Jesus finished the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, his disciples came to Jesus and asked, Did you get that? The scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus' disciples came. So what did that mean? So the majority of the crowd faded away, and guess who was left? The disciples. The ones that wanted a little more information, everybody else, they kind of said, well, he must be done, let's get out of here. Yeah, they're all out of turkey sandwiches, so let's bail. That's what was going on. His disciples, Matthew 13 tells us, his, Jesus' disciples came and asked. 
They ask, hey, would you tell us the finish of this story, of the parable? Would you translate that for us? I mean, here's a farmer planting in hard soil, good soil, rocky soil. We don't get it. And Jesus with a smile ear to ear. Yeah. Now the teaching begins. The parables are over. The folks that couldn't care less, they're gone. Now I'm going to pour in to you folks. Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 13. He says to his disciples, it has been given to you. Those of you that hung around. Those of you that made an effort. Those of you that sacrificed your afternoon. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It has been given to you to get to know the hidden wisdom of God. This mystery Paul's been talking about in, in our text. Not everybody gets that mystery because they don't care about it. They're punching their time card, thinking that they're doing something right. But you guys, you've hung around. And now I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to let you know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because you're searching for it. And because you've searched for it, You've found it. You found it. And again, Jesus' smile was ear to ear, and his heart was just pumping out of his chest. He says, I'm going to pour into you now. You're going to get everything I've got, you disciples. Paul continues on in our text in, in verse 10, but God has revealed his wisdom, this mystery, God has revealed His wisdom to us through His Spirit. So I repeat the previous verse because it bears repeating. God has revealed His wisdom to us through His Spirit. I repeat that because it's important. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him. So you and I as human beings, we relate to one another because we're humans. We can all relate in some fashion. I mean, when you walk in the door and you're coughing and and not feeling good and say, man, I feel crummy. I can turn around and say, I can relate. I know what you're talking about. I can dig it. This is a tough time of year sometimes for sickness. So we can relate as human beings. We, we, we relate. Physical to physical, we relate. That's, that's great. Even so, though, Paul goes on, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So again, as human beings, we can relate to one another. We are able to relate because we're human beings. Yet when it comes to the things of God, it is only the Spirit of God that reveals. Woman at the well? Hey, we were, I was taught by my human teachers that this is where we're to worship. And Jesus nodded his head and said, yeah, you were taught that. But now I'm going to teach you something. God, as you know, Jesus said, is spirit. And God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Boy, do you ever know other, some other lady that was set free that instant? I mean, she just went, yeah. That's what I've been searching for. I've been looking for relationships physically, but yet I need a relationship with Jehovah God, and I can only find it through His Holy Spirit, and that set her free. Instantaneously. She demonstrated her, her freedom by running back to town and said, hey, you got to come back with me, man. You have to. you got to come and meet this, this teacher. He teaches like nobody. I've ever heard, and I believe me, he teaches like no one you've ever heard. 
He is teaching who the Lord is. God is spirit. He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Therefore, the only way we get to know the Lord is through His Spirit. That's it. Now we have received, verse 12, Paul goes on, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Just like the Hebrew church, which we just studied, just like the Hebrew church, Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, is speaking to Christians. The Hebrew church was full of Christians. They were in a major backslidden condition. Major. But God didn't cast them away. That's why I chose to allow the Lord to reveal to me our next chapter, our next book to teach was we went through the Hebrew church, now we're going through the Gentile church. Same exact problems in both churches. Same exact things. Started out as born again believers, but began to get rocked to sleep. And guess who was doing the rocking? Satan himself. Oh, it's okay. I'll take good care of you. And that's exactly what's happening here with the Corinthian church. Paul was brought to get arrest the attention of the Christian church here at Corinth. And he's speaking to them as Christians. Hey, when I left, you were in good order. You were walking closely with Jesus, but I left and all of a sudden now, where's this other nonsense teaching coming from? It's not coming from the Lord. And I need to arrest your attention. Verse 13, these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but we teach which, the things which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So once again, in our human experience, we relate to one another in a natural way. But, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Lord, open my eyes. I mean, there's going to be a teaching today, and I, I don't want to necessarily, I, I'll listen to the communicator, but Lord, open my ears. So I can understand what you're wanting to teach me? I can read scripture all week long, but until I start saying, Lord, you teach me, I'm getting nowhere. I can read these words. I got an eighth grade education. I can read okay. But until I ask the Lord to teach me, I'm going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. Might as well go out and paint the wall or something. At least get something I can say, hey, look, look what I did today. Paul is saying, hey, we don't come and speak in a natural way. We come and speak under the power and the authority of God the Holy Spirit. Zechariah tells us clearly, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Pastor Chuck planted Calvary, the Calvary Chapel movement on that. One of, one of the many things he planted it on. But he said, hey, it's not, by my, it's not by our power. Oh, we're young, we're strong, we can lift things, sure. We can build stuff. But if, the, if it's not the Lord that builds the house, don't bother. And that's what Pastor Chuck started this movement, and we want to end it in the spirit of the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. Hey, you started in the spirit, as he's speaking to the Galatians, you, hey, you foolish Galatians, you started in the Spirit, now you think you're going to end in the flesh. Did you hear what I said? Paul said, you foolish Galatians. You're fools. This is a church that I planted. You're now fools. Because you are being drawn away from the finished work of Christ. That goes across the board. 
Anybody that is drawn away from the work of Christ and wants to replace it with their fancy flashbang presentation, they're fools. There was a guy in the Philippines, the, the pastor of his church, the Calvary Chapel uh, Dumaguete in, in uh, the Philippines. And in his pulpit, he had it taped onto his pulpit, and it said clearly, we want to see Jesus. And every time this pastor went into his pulpit, he saw that scripture. We came to see Jesus. And he saw that, and he lifted his eyes, and he saw, these people are here to see Jesus. They're not here to see me. They're here to see Jesus. And that was a great reminder for him every single time he got in that pulpit. Oh, sure, Lord, I'm your conduit. And I even have a nice pressed shirt on, and I cut my hair. But you know what? These folks are here to see Jesus. Wonderful pulpit. Wonderful. We're here to see Jesus. The, ma the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. It don't happen. The natural man doesn't tolerate the things of God. They are foolishness to him. And again, they're foolishness because these things of God are spiritually discerned. It's a spiritual matter. It's not a might by power, not, not a might nor power matter. And finally, as we close, but he who is spiritual judges all things. I think a little better word for judges is, if, you, if I may, he who is spiritual discerns. He who is spiritual has a knowledge. Okay, and that, that's a little more relatable to our modern day speaking. Um, the idea of he who is spiritual judge, judges, he who is spiritual discerns or has knowledge of all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Provided we are smack in the will of God, we will not be judged. But did anybody slip out of the will of God today by any chance? Oh, you spiritual holy folks? Or is it just me? Oh, it's just me? Oh. And I love the way James says it too. There's so much sarcasm in Scripture. James says, hey, if you can control your tongue, you know what? You're perfect. You're perfect. And James is just cracking up as the Spirit of the Lord is moving his pen. James is laughing his head off. I mean, one of those gut laughs. There's nobody in the world that can control their tongue. But if they could, they'd be perfect. That's funny. That's sarcastic. I think it's hilarious. And it's the same idea here. Hey, you know, yeah, he himself is rightly judged by no one provided I'm smack in the will of God. When I am in the will of God, no, I can't be judged. But you know, I easily slip to the left and easily slip to the right. But when I'm praising and worshiping God, I am smacking His will. But when I'm driving down the 91 freeway and some guy cuts in front of me, I am not praising the Lord at that moment. <laughs> Sorry. Confessions of your pastor. <gasps> and so there's, there's a little bit of lightheartedness here. Uh, he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one, provided he is smack in the middle of God's will. And so Paul can write this with authority because he knows that you're gonna, someone's going to correct you someday because you're going to go off to the left or to the right. You will. It's a guarantee. Why? Because you're a human being. Wow. Welcome to the human race. Praise the Lord. It's a good thing. It's funny, though. It's just, I mean, it's... It, the Bible, the scripture is hilarious. It's funny. Yet for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Anybody correct the Lord today? No? Good. Whew. Hope not, right. 
Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, as quoted by Paul in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13 and 14. But then, so, hey, who has instructed the Lord, but Paul doesn't leave us hanging. He says, but remember, we, as born-again believers, have the mind of Christ. So Paul just doesn't leave us flapping in the wind. He says, hey, you have the mind of Christ. And Paul, by inference, is saying, stay smack in the middle of God's heart, of Jesus' heart. There's an old song that we used to sing at Calvary from up in the high desert at uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, Lancaster. Um, uh, I can't think of the brother's name. Uh, Dwayne Clark. Great song. Near to your heart, Lord, is where I want to be. I've always loved that song. And that's what Paul is saying. You stay near to Jesus' heart and he'll lead the way. If I could ask George to come join me up on the platform here. I had previously pointed out that there are two of many fascinating things our teacher, the Holy Spirit, has revealed in Matthew chapter 13. The first thing that I noted for us was that Jesus himself revealed to his disciples that it was given to them the ability to understand the parables because they wanted to understand them. They hung around. And they demonstrated their eagerness to understand it. And so Jesus said, you came to the right place. You're smart. That was the first amazing thing that I noted. And the second thing I will point out about Matthew 13 is that while Jesus dismissed the crowds, his disciples, as noted, remained behind with Jesus And he concluded his teaching. Jesus defined the parable of the sower and the other parables simply because these guys wanted to know. They demonstrated by their actions that they were touched. They demonstrated that. Oh, the people that left verbalized that they were touched. But their actions showed other. They were trying to hustle home and catch the score of the Rams game. I don't blame them. (laughs) But these are the little things that we sacrifice unto our Lord. And these disciples stuck around and Jesus gleefully poured into them. His disciples had changed hearts as demonstrated by their changed lives. Has your born again experience changed anything in your life? Can someone look at your life and say, gee, there has been something that's changed in this man or this woman's life? Or do people kind of say, I had no idea they were born again? I don't know. One of the greatest compliments in my early walk with the Lord was my wife was over at picking up our vehicle at a mechanic shop and they were having conversation about something and it turned towards some spiritual things and Connie said, oh yeah, my husband, and this is a, a new relationship that we had just had, oh my husband, he's uh, the, the associate pastor at Calvary Chapel and the mechanic kind of looked at her as she told me the story and kind of said, you know, I believe that. It was a new relationship and, we, and, and time was, was peeling off until we could get into spiritual things. And I was glad to know that I had the ability through my life, my actions, my feet, my hands, and my conversation, that even though I hadn't announced that we were Christians yet, he knew when, when it was time for my wife to reveal that, he received that. He said, yeah. I believe that. I would have been heartbroken if he would have said, what, that bum? That guy, that foul mouth, knucklehead? You know what, he yelled at my other, some of my employees, and you know, he went in there and trashed this or that, or he brings his vehicles in, and they're just a mess, and these bumper stickers, what, that guy's an associate pastor, huh? None of that at all. 
And that really humbled me. And it was really the Lord saying, I'm changing your life. And I was so happy. I didn't have to say a word. I was just so grateful unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Has your born again condition changed your life? Have you allowed that? Can people tell that you're born again? Or do they kind of set their head back and go, hmm, I'll have to think about that one. That can be changed starting today. Jesus' disciples, they hung around. They had changed hearts, and they demonstrated that by their changed lives. They used to fade away with the crowd. But now they stuck around. Jesus, can we have a moment? He said, absolutely, I've got all day. And they said, great. The Corinthian church lost that desire to be led by God the Holy Spirit. They lost that desire. Well, they were gathering. They had a couple of Bibles here. There are some scrolls, what have you. They gave an hallelujah here and there, sure. But the Corinthian church lost the desire to be led by God the Holy Spirit. They began mixing worldly ideas in with the church. And we're seeing what God thinks about that. He says, no. No way. Unacceptable. Words of God. Unacceptable. I will not tolerate that. Repent. Come back. Written to the Corinthian church, but absolutely front page news for you and I. Lord, let us recognize that in our born again condition, you have and are continuing to change our lives. Let that be evident by our humble walk. Let that be evident for our, by our love for you. And let that be evident as we reach out to those with loving compassion and godly understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to worship the Lord and then break, George is going to lead us this morning in a beautiful song that he has written. Join, join me by standing. Meditate on this song. If you need prayer after the song, come on up to the front. We'll be glad to meet with you. But let's take a moment and unplug and allow the Lord to speak to us this morning. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hi, everybody. Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos? You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.